All in favor? Oppose, it's carried, thank you. Uh, to the board members, uh, any um, announcement of conflict of interest on the agenda as presented to you this afternoon? All right, hearing none, that uh, will we'll, uh, that'll be noted. Thank you. And uh, updates, uh, I'll call upon uh, Dr. Nezateri uh, to give us an update uh, on our favorite subject for the past 26 months, COVID-19, where we're at and where we're going. And so I will turn the floor over to you, Dr. Nezateri. So um, members of the Board of Health, Board Chair, uh, Mr. Mr. McNamara, McNamara. Uh, my colleagues, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to share the, my perspective <laughs> today. Uh, with your indulgence, I'm not going to speak that much about COVID. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about monkeypox, but we're in a more quiescent phase of COVID. I think the reason we're in a more quiescent phase is probably disease activity is lower. I also think that in the summers, and one has to consider that, that in general respiratory diseases are less prominent uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, I, I do think we still have to maintain our vigilance, and I don't think the pandemic is over. Um, uh, but I, uh, and I think we have to at least uh, consider the possibility that we may have an upsurge, uh, an increase in COVID activity as the fall uh, comes forth. We are seeing increased activity in the flu. Um, uh, that's a challenging thing to, to manage to the extent that this is typically the end of the flu season. And we're now seeing lots of, or we're having lots of reports of flu documented on testing. One has to be cautious in how to interpret that because it's also the number of tests, uh, people, the number of people who test positive is in part a function of the number of tests you offer. And, uh, but I think it's a true signal that we have a resurgence of flu and we should monitor that. Um, one of the reasons we did not have flu in the previous two seasons is people were engaged in wearing a mask, social distancing or physical distancing. And now that we have additional relaxations, we probably have increased flu activity. Um, I want to shift a little bit over to monkeypox. Um, uh, and at the onset, of, and I'll, 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 the, the goal of the public health service is to keep the community healthy, but also have a meaningful balance between the risks and the benefits of community-wide interventions and community-wide approaches. So what, We've been all hearing about monkeypox, but what exactly is monkeypox? Well, a pox metaphorically is a plague or a curse. And in, in, you, know, uh, you may even hear a pox to you and your family, I think was used in the literature. But, but in medicine, words have more, uh, uh, more precise and defined meanings. So a pox simply means uh, a skin rash that's caused by a virus that's characterized by pimples, that ultimately contain pus or fluid. There are lots of pox type illnesses. There's chicken pox, uh, 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 there's cow pox, there's monkey pox, molossum contagiosum. So pox is merely a descriptor. Monkey pox is one type of pox disease or pox type disease. And it was in fact um, first discovered in monkeys in 1958. The first human cases were in 1970. I hear it's an important point to at least understand or to acknowledge that monkeys were not probably were probably not the natural reservoir. I think the general view is, is that rodents are the natural reservoir. But I think that's still up for debate. So the first human cases of monkeypox occurred in 1970. And monkeypox is part of a virus family that includes smallpox, cowpox. Uh, 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 a virus called vaccina. What are the symptoms of uh, monkeypox? So the typical course of someone's monkeypox is they feel unwell for a few days, and then they get a rash on their face or thorax or hands or genitals. Um, the, the feeling of unwellness is many times associated with fever, chills, muscle aches, fatigue, a headache. But once somebody gets the rash, uh, um, uh, um, uh, then you'll start to see that rash persist for two to four weeks. The rash will ultimately scab over. Is there a treatment for, uh, 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 is there a treatment? Yes, there is. First of all, if you do get monkey pox, there are medicines one can get to try to attenuate the course of illness. There's also what we call post-exposure 
uh, vaccination, meaning that if you're exposed to monkeypox, um, but not yet have the disease, we could vaccinate people. And theoretically, we could vaccinate people against the monkeypox altogether. The monkeypox vaccine is, in fact, the same vaccine that we use for smallpox. And until 1972, uh, if, let me qualify that, until the 70s, I think 72 was the cut point, um, people were vaccinated against smallpox. Smallpox was eradicated, uh, I believe, in the 2000s in Africa. And so people aren't getting smallpox vaccine. But so there is a vaccine. When somebody is infectious, they can give the disease to somebody else. And so this is an important thing from the public health service. We obviously want to treat individual patients, and that's the responsibility of the doctors who are responsible for the patient. But And we are, too, at some extent of the public health service. But we're particularly worried about transmission of disease from person to person to person, the community medicine part of it. How can monkeypox be transmitted? Well, it can be transmitted by the fluids in the source. And so if one person uh, gets exposed to the fluid in the source, especially if there's a little cut, they can develop monkeypox. It can also be transmitted by fomites, meaning inanimate objects. So if you're sleeping in a bed uh, 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 and you share sheets, then if someone else sleeps in that bed, they can perhaps get monkeypox. On that line, if someone has an intimate relationship, if someone has sex with someone else uh, and they're sleeping in the same bed and one person has sores and the other person doesn't, they can potentially get monkeypox. But other intimate activities like hugging and kissing can also potentially be transmission of, uh, of monkeypox. When is one infectious? Well, they're infectious. Um, let me just say that you can also transmit monkeypox through respiratory particles. Uh, so if you breathe on someone and you have monkeypox, you might transmit it to somebody else. When is somebody infectious? Well, one is typically infectious when you actually have the lesions or when you're symptomatic. So um, the, 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 that's sort of the, the general rule of thumb. And uh, when do you stop being infectious? You stop being infectious um, when a last lesion scabs over, it's a couple of weeks after the fact. If you come in contact with someone with monkeypox, and what, what else do we do from a public health service? If you have monkeypox, you're under self-isolation or quarantine while during the infectious period. What if you're exposed to monkeypox? So someone in your family has monkeypox um, and you live in the same household. Well, we monitor those people for three weeks or so, and we don't quarantine those people, but we ask them to be responsible. Being responsible means limiting their contacts, wearing a mask when they go outdoors, not engaging in unnecessary uh, interaction, but they can go to school and go to work. That's our general guidance today. Um, what do we know right now uh, from a public health risk point of view? So I started about talking about risk, and I'll go back to risk at a population health level. Right now in Ontario, um, there are 29 recognized or confirmed cases of, of monkeypox. Most of them are in Toronto, um, but there are cases in other parts of, this, uh, of the province as well. Most of the cases up to this point are men have, are, are in communities where men are having sex with men. That doesn't mean that the, the disease or the monkeypox will be limited to that population. In Africa, uh, where monkeypox is uh, endemic, it's not just limited to that community. We should always be cautious about stigma. Uh, but we should also recognize that we want to try to uh, um, provide the best possible public health management for the people that might be exposed and are at risk. At this point in time, the risk of uh, to the, the overall community for monkeypox is low. And I think that's the key message. The risk is low. We also have a vaccine and we have medical treatment to help manage this. That all being said, the, the mortality rate uh, uh, in Africa is reported, and the numbers do vary, but the best number I've seen up to this point is like 3 to 6%. But I think my guess is that's probably an overstatement of the risk because a lot of people with monkeypox in Africa are probably not recognized to have um, the illness. So with that, I would close with this. We have a challenge with monkeypox. 
It is part of what the public health service does on a daily basis. We manage communicable and infectious diseases along with the doctors and hospitals in the community overall and, and with the nursing service and all the other health professionals that are involved. And we do have a management plan. And that management plan will be refined as we know more about uh, about monkeypox. Uh, but at this point in time, I would say the risk to the community is low. So thank you so much. I think I ate up more time than I was permitted. And my apologies, about, uh, Mr. McNamara, but I'm happy to answer any questions as well. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nesateri. Any questions are, uh, to uh, uh, our MOH? I don't see any. I think you Tracy. Uh, Tracy has a question, Mr. McNamara. Oh, okay. I don't see her, but uh, do I? Okay, go ahead, Tracy. Thank you so much. Uh, recognizing that there was uh, an update, uh, a clinical kind of clinician update uh, posted to the website uh, May 26, um, 2022. Wondering whether or not your FAQ uh, from today will be posted and, and become a resource that people can go to for basic information. I just found it really helpful the way that you were able to break it down and, and talk about the fact that we, we know about it and we uh, understand it and we need to manage it. The risk is low um, in some of the uh, definitions and, and um, things that you provided today were a little bit more um, understandable, I guess, from a community nature. So I'm just wondering whether or not uh, there'll be something added to the website where the public can go as well. So maybe I could start and ask Nicole. Um, um, so I, I think that's an excellent idea. The execution of that really is in the province of Nicole, and I would ask her to maybe assign staff to put something together, and I'm happy to help uh, uh, edit yeah. and refine that. Yeah, so that is already underway. So what you're seeing the website for clinicians is um, because that's some of the original and initial material that came up from the province. And Felicia's nodding. I saw Eric almost show his face for a minute uh, from a communications perspective, but um, our direction um, has been to um, continually update our website. We just want to be in step with the province and um, they have prepared some initial um, more lay person language. Again, um, you know, framing it from Health Canada and, and World Health Organization and, and other resources so that you will see more of that, um, Tracy, that uh, will be for sort of the average person so that they understand um, what the disease is, the symptoms, what to look out for, um, who is at highest risk, et cetera. So we will be adding that information to our website. And certainly Felicia and Eric can add if they like, but. Um, yeah, there's I some... think you have captured it quite well for what we're working on right now. And yes, we are working on developing messages and working to align the messages for consistency as well in messaging, where it's in plain language and and anyone can consume that information and understand what they need to do and what the disease is and what risk or precautions um, that they need to be aware of for themselves. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Joe. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, doctor, just in terms of uh, the medical officer health uh, position uh, yourself locally or, or provincially, in terms of the COVID you mentioned in, in the fall, there could be a resurgence of COVID cases. Uh, if that's the case, what, what messaging or recommendations uh, would we give parents, especially in that 12 to 17 year old range where they got their, you know, some got their vaccines or second dose? Uh, should they be getting their booster? A lot of them, even the 18 to 20 year olds, they haven't got their booster shot yet. And they're, they were just holding it. I know our percentage was low in that range. Is that something where we still want to educate and, and, and encourage uh, for, for the start of the fall? Uh, what kind of game plan, you know, do you, do you envision that uh, you would recommend to the parents uh, going back to school in the fall? If they have say an 18 to 20 year old, should they be going for their booster shot and whatnot? Yeah, the short answer is yes. If, uh, you know, I would recommend the booster. I would recommend that all people become up to date on their vaccines. If I could just expound on that a bit, we have waning immunity. So um, uh, after a certain period of time from your last injection, uh, you lose the effect or lose substantively the effect of the vaccine. That's either four or five, six months after the fact. If we're going to manage COVID on an individual level, then it's important to get vaccinated because vaccinated people 
uh, who have, are up to date are likely less likely to get seriously ill from COVID. Um, uh, uh, so I think that's an important thing for young people. Also, we want to do our very best to try to keep them in school. Um, the second is the public health part, the transmission of illness, and we want to do our best to minimize the transmission of illness as well, and um, uh, and the and the burden of disease overall. So um, I think that. I think there is benefit uh, uh, in getting up to date on your boosters, and I would recommend that for young people and all people who are eligible for booster injections to get to to get them. If you ask me about what my real one of my concerns is, that I think at the current time, and Nicole can correct me, pro, uh, less than forty percent of the people in the district are up to date on their vaccine, and if we start seeing a resurgence of cases. Um, yeah. Then we'll 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 struggle. To, the pe first of all, the people who are affected by COVID do suffer. Most people recover, but some people have long-term sequelae from COVID. And uh, 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 and you know there there is some evidence that there are some of the sequelae for some people are permanent or likely permanent. So I, I think that we really have to get the population vaccinated so that we can help the, the individuals. The second issue is I worry about the burden to the health system. If we start seeing a resurgence of uh, of COVID cases and people that are seriously ill and need to be hospitalized, I think that will be one additional challenge to the health system. I was in a meeting today where hospital leaders and executives were concerned about emergency room capacity, and we're in a low, we're in a low point in COVID activity or a lower point. So that too is a concern of mine. Uh, for, once again, uh, my apologies for being long-winded in this response. No, yeah. well, thank you. I appreciate it, and I think it's important what you mentioned about the way in immunity that you know the COVID is not over; uh, it, it it could still come back, and and, and those that are not up to date uh, are, are vulnerable. And I think that's a, a message uh, that I think we we should be uh, mentioning and 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 coming this fall. So thank you for that. Yeah, just before I go to Judy, just I just want to add is. You know, just uh, alluded to uh, today, it's a, in, and not only here, but in in other areas where uh, we're experiencing a lot of cold blacks in our EMS services. Uh, uh, ERs are are full as we speak, without uh, a resurgent uh, at the, at the time. So uh, I think the messaging has to be almost on a daily basis. You know, to let folks know that. We've got to get, uh, you know, our, our boosters and and, uh, uh, and and get them up to date because we could be in a, a bit of a pickle come, uh, you know, come the fall. Judy? Uh, seems like my picture's blocked. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, okay. so um, a couple questions for Dr. Nessateri. Uh One, can you just speak to why, again, these type of vaccines you need more often than say the childhood ones you get that last decades and also can you speak to um has there been any studies with respect to women and the impact on the vaccine on the menstrual cycle i think a couple of these things younger people there's more questions and information and a personal experience out there and so my experience with with young women in my family is they've gotten the first vaccine or the second but have had some impact and you know feel that that's enough so if you could speak to those two questions i would appreciate that sure well some vaccines have the nature of the vaccine you know the theory of a vaccine is is that uh, uh, you present a challenge to the body and then the body uh, learns its, its immune system learns about the uh, the uh, uh, the pathogen and then if the challenged again, they can eradicate the pathogen. Some uh, some vaccines, by the nature of the vaccination, give lifelong immunity, and others require constant or re regular revaccination. In part, that relates to the disease, and in part, it relates to the vaccine. Uh, the flu uh, changes, and as the flu changes, you have to change the vaccine formulation, and we've been doing that for a long time. COVID changes, and I think that has some impact on it, uh, but also um, uh, it's probably related to the nature of the vaccine itself. That, uh, I'm not a vaccine uh, expert, but that would be sort of um, a more uh, 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 cursory understanding of that. 
I don't think there's any compelling evidence that menstrual cycles are affected by COVID vaccination. Um, you know, medicine, you never say never for anything. You never, like, you never say never, but I think the wealth of the evidence and uh, uh, um, is that there's no real effect uh, uh, on the menstrual cycle. Um, but you know what, uh, just to be sure, because uh, the literature is full, I, I will do a, uh, we'll do a search on this. And at the next board meeting uh, or before, I'll, I'll, we'll, we, can, uh, we can discuss that. But to my understanding, there's no real effect on the menstrual cycle related to vaccination. Now, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding of the literature up to this point. Thank you. No, there's, yeah, this question has been asked and reviewed. Um, by Public Health Ontario, and um, so uh, Dr. Nisthiri, we can probably just pull some of those reports and share them, but um, a review of the body of the evidence doesn't really support that claim. Okay, good. That. Thank you. All right, any further questions or comments? Yes, uh, Ed. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Can you hear me? I wasn't sure. Yes. Um, anyway, I, I have a question. I think it Part of it had been answered by the doctor. You were saying that the the flu is changing, COVID had been changing, so we have to keep on we have to keep on top of it. Every every once in a while, we have to come up with a new vaccine. And kind of the reason I asked for it. This morning, I went to shop at Drug Mart, and I picked up. This is my fourth shot. I was saying to myself, "That's it. That's the end of it." But listening to you, it seems like. We have to be ready when the, the disease have changed. That's what uh, my concern. Well, also about the fact that, that the vaccine's biological effect is more time limited. I think that's really the phenomenon that we're dealing with is uh, uh, the, the, vac the virus is changing, but also the vaccines um, uh, has a time limited benefit. It's, it's not, a, you know, we give boosters for other vaccines as well. As a general construct, I think moving forward, we have to normalize our lives toward COVID. And that means that among other things that when there's higher disease activity, we have to have more public health measures. People have to make rational choices about risk versus benefit. Um, um, and uh, getting a regular vaccination, uh, it should be part of the suite of interventions that one has to consider uh, moving forward. I think that's the, the, to me, that's the most rational public health approach is to say, we're just gonna have to learn to live with this, just like we learned to live with HIV. At some point, we'll have more robust and available antiviral medications, uh, more refined vaccines, and uh, we may have to just modify our treatment or public health management. But for now, I think the booster on a regular basis is gonna be what we need to do. Thank you very much, doctor. You're welcome. Okay, any further questions or, uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Nazateri? Okay, don't see any hands, or, so then we'll move on. Thank you again for, um, for that, Dr. Nazateri. So we'll move on to uh, the approval of the minutes of uh, our board meeting of May 19th, moved by Judy, supported by Ed. On those minutes, any errors or omissions? Hearing none, all in favor? Always offended, that is carried, thank you. Business arising, uh, board bylaws, Nicole, and I think uh, you wanna talk about the procurement policy. Mm -hmm. So um, we, a little slower than promised on our uh, progress towards updating some of these elements, but um, this is just part of um, the policies and the adjustments to our bylaws. So not for decision at this time, just for review and any questions. And um, it, you'll find it in your package. I'll maybe turn over to Lori if she wants to highlight any of the specific changes um, that it were made to the procurement policy, and then we're happy to answer questions and it'll come back in a uh, future time uh, with the rest of our bylaws for approval. So I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, so just walking you through the key aspects of the policy. As Nicole said, this is a part of an overall review of our consolidated bylaws. And with that, there are certain policies that require updating. 
sorry. So just walking through the primary purpose, and I think um, one of the key changes in the procurement policy is, you know, a better articulation of the purpose of the policy. Um, more specifically, because the health unit is a public funded organization, um, you know, it, it's really imperative to identify that this policy needs to support not only our strategic and our operational requirements, but any contractual or legislative obligations that we have. Um, you know, articulating that uh, the policy needs to mitigate risk, both from financial risk, but also reputational risk that um, the policy should support an environment of continuous improvement and the policy should articulate uh, a process that is fair, honest, has integrity and avoids conflict of interest, impropriety and non-discriminative practices. The revisions to the policy also more clearly articulate the goals of the policy and more specifically ensuring that procurement, the procurement process is efficient, timely and cost effective that the procurement policy is inclusive of all financial impacts. So for instance, ensuring that um, as uh, we embark upon procurements that we are including both direct and indirect costs in arriving and evaluating procurements, uh, ensuring that uh, the procurement, procurements that are undertaken are inclusive of the entire contract life cycle. So not only looking at the current year impact, but especially in the service contract, looking at the multi-year impact that our procurements consider any relevant legislative obligations. So for instance, if there is any AODA compliance requirements uh, that our procurement process uh, monitors and reports on any economic climate and legislative changes, and that our procurement process also has due consideration for environmental and sustainability considerations. So for instance, as we're looking at things like copiers and printers, ensuring that we are getting um, equipment that is environmentally friendly and cost effective. Previously in our consolidated bylaws, um, as I had referenced last month, uh, there were values, improvement in, approval values that were included within the context of the bylaw. Those values are no longer included in the revised bylaw and are just specified within the context of the policy. So the next two slides delineate the various procurement values. Um, the changes from the prior policy are that the low dollar value procurements were previously zero to $250. And now we've changed that to zero to 500. Non-competitive procurements previously were from 250 to $2,499. We've now modified that level to 500 to 7,500. And then uh, a second level from 7,500 to 10,000. The next slide, um, any non-competitive procurements above the $10,000 mark would require board uh, approval, as well as a number of internal approvals. And then, of course, um, anything over the $100,000 mark at a non-competitive level would require board approval um, or at a comp with competitive procurement would, could be approved by the CEO. So irrespective of the procurement value, however, the policy clearly articulates that it is always best practice to endeavor to um, ascertain the best dollar value uh, for, the, for what you are acquiring and obtaining uh, multiple quotations to support. So, so while something might be a zero to $500, it still may be uh, more efficient uh, from a dollar value perspective to uh, obtain other quotations to get the best value for money. And the last thing to, I wanted to touch upon, uh, the previous policy did speak to a review of the policy. Uh, we've now identified that the policy review period will be a two-year period to align with what is stated within the context of the revised bylaw, or more frequently, if uh, there are significant legislative requirements uh, that would require us to revisit the parameters of a bylaw. Additionally, uh, we have an audit uh, requirement, um, and there are some specified procedures that will be undertaken on a quarterly basis by the finance department and then reported 
uh, both to the leadership team and as well to the Board of Health. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori. Uh, any questions or, or comments to uh, to Lori? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Uh, to either uh, Lori or Nicole, I guess I'm just curious about maybe an example of a non-competitive quote that's either over ten thousand dollars or over a hundred thousand dollars, requiring uh, the board's approval. Um, what circumstances would that be? Um, I imagine there are probably some sole sourcing um, implications that uh, need some flexibility with that, but is that the extent of it or are there others that I should be aware of as a board member? Uh, so we've had, I'll give you a, a for instance, we had an instance in the last five years where uh, a particular organization worked with uh, a university doing research where it made sense to utilize that organization to support a service need. So that is something that was documented in a board resolution and brought to the board for their decision and approval before proceeding with the contract. Uh, there could be a scenario where again, it's um, licensing. So we had uh, a scenario with regards to a certain application that um, was used by multiple other health units that it seemed ideal for us to migrate to an application that other health units were using. And that was a, you know, a single source option that was brought to the board, recommended to the board for their approval. So those are instances, but again, each instance would have to be reviewed in isolation uh, to determine. I think, yeah, I think what you're asking is how often or what examples would we now for things under $10,000 where is that more what you're asking, Mark? We it wouldn't it doesn't happen often. No, it's when I was looking at the um, the matrix that was up on the screen and it spoke to ten thousand to hundred thousand and a hundred thousand and over non-competitive procurement process requiring board approval and that there would be a report brought before the board making such a request and providing adequate explanation for why it would be non-competitive. So I'm just trying to understand the scenario or okay. the formality of, of something like that. Yeah, so Lori's correct in applications where other agencies have moved forward or there's a timing need and we need to move quickly um, would be examples that we've brought forward again, in the past for consideration. But again, those are relatively infrequent, Mark. Um, and that, and again, they would be it would be something that the administration would be reviewing in quite a bit of detail before they brought it forward to the board. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, any further questions or comments? Oh, hearing none. So we're looking for a resolution, uh, uh, Lori. I Not, believe we um, would just be accepting it, receiving it's it. It's just at for this point. receipt of her information, and we'll bring it forward with the Hi. at the end with the rest of the bylaws for approval. Okay, thank you. Then uh, a would be appropriate would be a motion to receive uh, Lori's report. Moved by Aldo and supported by uh, Joe. No further questions or comments. All in favor? Pose if any, that is carried. Thank you. All right, move to consent agenda. There are uh, four items there. Uh, if I could have a motion to receive um, the consent agenda. Mark, thank you. And supported by Ed. Uh, okay, um, uh, is there any uh, items that uh, out of the four that uh, certain administration you'd like to highlight in your report? Okay, on the motion, all in favor? Oppose if any, that is carried, thank you. We have no resolutions to deal with uh, um, uh, this afternoon, members of the board, so we'll move on to uh, 8 which is new business. Employee mental health and well being renewal uh, priority, and uh, Nicole and Dan. 
So um, Dan's not here, so it'll just be Nicole. Um, but just um, wanted to provide a brief update and uh, we'll bring a little bit more information in the future for our board, but um, recognizing the impact obviously of the pandemic on everyone's overall health and well-being, but in particular the um, sort of the burden of the pandemic on health services, community services, and definitely our public health service and staff. As you know, when we presented our renewal um, and transformation plan for 2022, so what are some of the activities that we'll be undertaking from a service level perspective this year um, to sort of, again, move towards, you know, what we're not calling re recovery, but renewal. Um, mental health uh, was identified as a priority, and so not just for um, community, um, but also internally for um, staff. Um, I just wanted to share with the board that we are, um, we have shared with staff that we are, uh, as part of this initiative and activities, we're working on a number of, um, a number of items, uh, one of which will be uh, working with uh, Occupation Health Clinic Ontario workers, so OCAO, um, and we'll to develop an assessment um, around mental health using uh, the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire. Um, and so we hope to strike a, a committee or a working group within, um, led through HR within um, the health unit, um, work with OCAO um, to um, launch a uh, mental health and well-being assessment, um, and then use the results of that assessment to sort of plan what our initiatives and activities will be um, going forward. Um, so just wanted to be able to share um, some of the activities that we've at least started to undertake and we have a plan uh, towards the end of the year and I think it'll be really positive for our staff. Um, there's a few other components that I think we'll address at a later time, but wanted to just give that update and we'll we'll give a more formal report when we've had we have more to share. All right, any questions or comments to uh, to Nicole? Hearing none, a motion to receive the verbal report from uh, Nicole. Uh, Tracy, thank you, and Ed, support. All in favor? Opposed, if any, that is carried. Thank you. Move on 8.2, the July Board of Health uh, meeting. Uh, Nicole? Yeah, so um, traditionally, for those who've been on the board a while um, and those who are new, you may not know this, but uh, traditionally, we, we try to uh, give uh, a break, I suppose, um, and not have our regular board meetings for July and August. Um, we do, you do currently have in your calendar slated a, a board meeting for July. We will need to convene a meeting um, for July, um, specifically for our financial statements. Um, so our from our audit committee review and then to approve those financial statements um, as well. We expect there'll be a few other items and updates um, relative to our project governance committee for July. Um, I just wanted to pose it here right now. It's slated for July 21st. Um, we'd like no summer's difficult with everybody's timing and would like to maybe propose moving it the week prior um, but wanted to bring it here one to notify you that we will need to um, have a july board meeting um, we promise it'll be short um, just to deal with it won't be additional business just to deal with our um, budgetary um, you know the financial statements that will we need uh, approval for and um, so looking one just for notice that we will need a July board meeting and whether there's agreement to move it for the week prior, which is the week of July 11th. Recognizing summer July is a big vacation time for everyone. OK, by me. I'm glad you, uh, you moved it because I, I think I'm on vacation the following week. Yeah. Um, so am I, but I was going to join. <laughs> ah, okay, so uh, uh, we did not coordinate this, uh, members of the board. This is uh, completely illegitimate. Um, okay, so maybe Leanne, you can uh, send out an outlook. Yeah, I'll yep. do that. Okay. Tracy? Thank you through you. Just wondering if it's your intent, Nicole, to align it with the JBEC meeting that's already scheduled for July 11th. Um, we could. That was one item that we brought up. We wouldn't be approving a regular board agenda for the so for JBEC normally uh, does review our agenda. We wouldn't be doing that. So that is an option. Um, and what we could do is just put out that option or the Thursday if that works for people. But um, 
So the JBAC meeting is on a Monday, which is the July 11th. So City Council has a meeting that day, just an FYI for four of us. On the 11th, I should say. Okay, well, I think you were referring to the J. Uh, oh, you want to coordinate both. Yeah, that's true. Mondays are bad for City Council. So I think we can just Thursday. Yeah, so we could do this Thursday, which is we were just thinking the week yep. before. Yep. Um, OK, so Leanne will follow up with everyone and put the calendar invite and then we can get um, see if that works for most. Okay. And again, I promise it'll just be the few items, so hopefully. Uh, yeah. But yeah, keep it light. Very light, you know, finance, so light. <laughs> yeah, finance, very light. Oh. OK. So we'll leave we'll leave it in uh, in Leanne's capable hands. Uh, uh, send out uh, you know uh, in requests and in in Outlook, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll certainly go from there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. No correspondence to review to review. So. Um, What's left here is we need to, uh, to go into the Committee of the Whole closed session in accordance with uh, Section 239 of the Municipal Act. So if I get a motion to move in camera. Reno and. Uh,